If used at all, it can only be that their weakness and utter worthlessness will be exposed. Atheism and every other form of infidelity are thus rendered helpless. Their sting is cut away, and their poison dissipated. The irreligious philosopher can no longer obtrude his theories as things proved wherewith to test the teachings of Scripture. He must now himself be tested. He must be forced to demonstrate his premises, a thing which he has never yet attempted. And if he fails in this respect, his impious vanity, self-conceit, and utter disregard of justice will become so clearly apparent that his presence in the ranks of science will no longer be tolerated. All theory must be put aside, and the questions at issue must be decided by independent and practical evidence. This has been done. The process, the modus operandi, and the conclusions derived therefrom have been given in the early sections of this work. They are entirely consonant with the teachings of Scripture. The Scriptures are, therefore, literally true, and must henceforth, either alone or in conjunction with the practical science, be used as a standard by which to test the truth or falsehood of every system which does or may hereafter exist. Philosophy is no longer to be employed as a test of scriptural truth, but the Scriptures may and ought to be the test of all philosophy. Not that they are to be used as a test of philosophy simply because they are thought or believed to be the word of God, but because their literal teachings in regard to science and natural phenomena are demonstrably correct. It is quite as faulty and unjust for the religious devotee to urge their scriptures against the theories of the philosopher simply because he believes them to be true, as it is for the philosopher to urge his theories against the scriptures only because he disbelieves the one and believes the other. The whole matter must be taken out of the region of belief and disbelief. The Christian will be strengthened and his mind more completely satisfied by having it in his power to demonstrate that the scriptures are, by the simple belief of their validity, unsupported by practical evidence. On the other hand, to demonstrate that the scriptures are philosophically true, then he could possibly be, by the simple belief in their validity, unsupported by practical evidence. On the other hand, the atheist who is met by the Christian upon purely scientific grounds, and who is not belabored with enunciations of what his antagonist believes, will be led to listen and to pay more regard and respect to the reasons advanced than he could possibly concede to the purely religious argument or to an argument founded upon faith alone. If it can be shown to the atheistical philosopher that his astronomical and geological theories are fallacious, and that the expressions in the scriptures which have reference to natural phenomenon are literally true, he will of necessity be led to admit that, apart from all other considerations, if the philosophy of the scriptures is demonstrably correct, then possibly their spiritual and moral teachings may also be true. And if so, they may and indeed must have had a divine origin. And if so, they are truly the word of God. And after all, religion is a grand reality, and the theories which speculative adventurous philosophers have advanced are nothing better than treacherous quicksands, into which many of the deepest thinkers have been engulfed and lost. By this process, many highly intelligent minds have been led to the desert, the ranks of atheism, and to rejoin the army of Christian soldiers and devotees. Many have rejoiced, almost beyond expression, that the subject of the Earth's true form and position in the universe had never been brought under their notice, and doubtless great numbers will yet be induced to return to that allegiance which plain demonstrable truth demands and deserves to induce numbers of earnest-thinking human beings to leave the rebellious cause of atheism and false philosophy, to return to a full recognition of the beauty and truthfulness of the scriptures, and to a participation in the joy and satisfaction which religion can alone supply, is a grand and cheering result, and one which furnishes the noblest possible answer to the ever-ready qui bono. In addition to the numerous quotations which have been given from the sacred scriptures and proved to be true and consistent, it may be useful, briefly, to refer to the following difficulties which have been raised by the scientific objectors to scriptural authority. Quote, 
As the Earth is a globe, and as all is vast, collections of water, its oceans, lakes, and etc., are sustained by the earthy crust beneath them, and as beneath this crust of the Earth, everything is in a red-hot molten condition, to what place could the excess of waters retire, which are said in the scriptures to have overwhelmed the whole world? It could not sink into the center of the earth, for the fire there is so intense that the whole would be rapidly volatilized and driven away in its vapor. It could not evaporate, for when the atmosphere is charged with water vapor, beyond a certain degree, it begins to condense and throw back at the water in the form of rain. So that the waters of the flood could not sink from the earth's surface, nor remain in the atmosphere, therefore, if the earth had ever been deluged at all, it would have remained so to this day. But, as it is not universally flooded, so it never could have been, and the account given in the scriptures is false." End quote. All this specious reasoning is founded upon the assumption that the earth is a globe. This doctrine, however, being false, all the difficulties quickly vanish. The earth being founded on the seas would be as readily cleared of its superfluous water as would be the deck of a ship on emerging from a storm or as a rock in the ocean would be cleared after the raging waves which for a time overwhelmed it had subsided. Quote, Thou coveredst the earth with the deep as with a garment, the water stood above the mountains. In thy rebuke they fled, and the voice of the thunder they hasted away, down by the valleys unto the place which thou hast founded for them. End quote. Quote, thou didst leave the earth with rivers, and the overflowing of the waters passed by, and the deep uttered his voice and lifted up his hands on high, end quote. The surface of the earth standing above the level of the surrounding seas, the waters of the flood would simply and naturally run down by the valleys and rivers into the great deep, into which the waters returned off the earth continually until the tenth month, and on the first day of the month were the tops of the mountains seen, end quote. Again, as the earth is a globe and in continual motion, how could Jesus, on being taken up to an exceedingly high mountain, see all of the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time? Or, when, quote, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, end quote, how could it possibly, how could it be possible, seeing that at least twenty-four hours would elapse before every part of the earth would be turned at the same point? But it has been demonstrated that the earth is a plane and motionless, and that from a great eminence every part of its surface could be seen all at once, and at once, at the same moment, could every eye behold him when coming in a cloud with power and great glory. The End